So welcome to part one of Wars, Winners and Sinners. Today, we're going to start with a, a little bit of a survey. Now, I know I've said this in some previous messages, but um, a lot of people who know me know that I've been a fan of like hip hop music and rap for 20 something years, okay? Now, whenever you are around hip hop heads, you know, people that listen to rap music, okay? Uh, there's something that you can talk about once you introduce this topic, it spurs all kinds of debates and arguments and back and forth, okay? Now, the, the hip-hop heads in the room know what I'm talking about. Once you say, who is the greatest rapper of all time? Problem has started. You know, as I ask the question, I know the hip-hop heads in the room, you're already thinking of different names, you know? Because you got to weigh different things. You have to weigh, of course, most importantly, lyrics and flow. You have to weigh delivery you have to weigh sales you know how many people actually bought this guy's music and this guy's words how many people bought into it you have to weigh the impact on the culture their impact on the world and so when i say who's the greatest rapper or who's the greatest lyricist of all time you know you might be thinking jay or drake or eminem you know or kendrick lamar or if you're an og you're gonna say ah no these youngers don't know what they're talking about is big daddy kane you know or um a lot of people still insist on uh, the, the notorious B.I.G. or Tupac. Well, regardless of who your personal pick for the greatest rapper of all time is, whoever you choose, you are wrong. All right? I'm sorry to disappoint you. It is nobody that you're thinking of. Now, I never thought of this myself until I heard it from Stephen Furtick. And when he said it, it made perfect sense to me. Are you ready for the answer? Ladies and gentlemen, this is important. Because over the next mini-series, we're going to be studying different parts of this guy's life and some of the incidents and, and situations that he found himself and some of the wars that he found himself in and how he handled it, okay? So here it goes. The, the greatest rapper, the greatest lyricist of all time is the guy whose words are still being quoted over 3,000 years later. The one who pretty much every single person in the YouTube chat right now you know some of his lyrics, okay? Even if you've never listened to rap music, he was a musician and he was a warrior. He was a man of purpose and a man of pain, a man of flaws and a man of faith. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, make some noise for the greatest rapper, the greatest lyricist of all time, the one and only, drum roll please, King David, yes, MCKD. AKA Young Dave. All right, that just took me back to my days when I used to host One Africa Music Fest. Okay, King David is the true GOAT. He's the true greatest of all time. And we all know his hits because we quote them. You know, he had hits like, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. This is 3,000 years ago and we're still quoting them today. David wrote so many of the Psalms that we memorize and sing and pray over 3,000 years later. And when you think about the fact that they were not actually originally written in English, they were written in Hebrew and then translated to Greek and then translated to English and all the other languages that the Bible is in now. So aside from all of us millions of Christians over the years who have quoted Psalms that David wrote, You've got millions of Jews who quote his Psalms in the Torah. You even have millions of Muslims who've read his words in the Quran. Okay, so the greatest of all time, there is no debate about this. The greatest lyricist, the greatest rapper, the greatest musician of all time is King David, MCKD. Okay, so until you can find, uh, you can show me Jay or Drake or Eminem or whoever it is, lyrics being translated into tons of languages and different religions and millions of people quoting their words 3,000 years later, there's no debate about this. David was an incredibly fascinating character. Now you may not know this, but aside from God himself, there are more chapters in the Bible devoted to the life of David than anyone else. About 141 chapters in the Bible are about the life of David. David, like I said already, he wrote about half of the book of Psalms, confirmed, okay? He's confirmed to have written 73, but there were another two Psalms that were attributed to him and quoted as him being the author. And then there are another 49 Psalms or so that 
it is believed that David wrote some of them. Okay, so of all the characters and the stories in the Bible, the, all the heroes of faith that we read about and draw our inspiration from today, the story of David is the one that we know the most about. And I believe that God was intentional in making this the case. Me personally, David was my favorite uh, biblical character, my favorite hero of faith. Now, David was a king and a priest. He was a mighty warrior and a skilled musician. He was also a man of faith and many flaws. And I love the fact that the Bible does not mask the mistakes of these great men because it's important for us to be able to see ourselves in them. Amen? It's important for us as human beings to understand that in this fallen world as human beings, falling down is inevitable, but getting back up and repenting is completely optional. So it's what you do after you fall that determines how far you will go in achieving your destiny. Amen. And so let's start in Acts chapter 13 from verse 21 to 22. And I read the NLT version. It says, Then the people begged for a king, and God gave them Saul, son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, who reigned for 40 years. But God removed Saul and replaced him with David, a man about whom God said, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything that I want him to do. So today we're talking about wars, winners, and sinners. And when I was studying, you know, and I felt that God wanted me to, to look at certain parts of the life of David, I wanted to dive right in and straight into the story of David and just unpack it and start learning the lessons that were there. But I felt the Holy Spirit stop me. And he said, you know, to properly understand why God chose David and rejected Saul, we need to fully grasp what David did right and what Saul did wrong. And so instead of diving right into the life of David, we're going to start this series looking at some of the mistakes Saul made. And so on day one of this series, there's a subtitle that we're going to call The Pitfalls of Saul. The Pitfalls of Saul. And that's where we're going to start today. Now, we don't have enough time to go through the entire life story of David or Saul and, and all of the mistakes that they made and their wins and losses because there is a lot to take in. What I want to do is point out some very specific pitfalls so that we can watch out for them in our own lives. You know, we all read these biblical stories and it's like we immediately want to liken ourselves to the good guy. So we read about David and Saul and we automatically think that we're more like David, okay? But if we're really being honest, and if I'm really being honest, I've made some very Saul-ish decisions in my life. So let's start in 1 Samuel chapter 15. Like I said, we don't really have the time to read the whole chapter. There are many, many verses in this chapter. So let me give you a bit of background. The Amalekites were a people, were an atrocious people. When Israel was coming out of Egypt, they went to war with Israel. They were very difficult. They committed all kinds of heinous, atrocious crimes against God, against Israel, against humanity. They were just a, just a, a bad set of people. Okay? So in 1 Samuel chapter 15, God gives Saul instructions to wipe out the Amalekites. He said, listen, kill everyone, destroy everything, take nothing, leave nothing. And that's what happens at the beginning of this chapter. So let's pick up in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 9, after Saul is done winning the battle. So I read, it says, Saul and his men spared King Agag's life and kept the best of the sheep and goats, the cattle, the fat calves, and the lambs, everything, in fact, that appealed to them. They destroyed only what was worthless or of poor quality. Then the Lord said to Samuel, I am sorry that I ever made Saul king, for he has not been loyal to me and he has refused to obey my command. Samuel was so deeply moved when he heard this that he cried out to the Lord all night. Early the next morning, Samuel went to find Saul. Someone told him Saul went to the town of Carmel to set up a monument to himself and then he went on to Gilgal. When Samuel finally found him, Saul greeted him cheerfully and said, May the Lord bless you. I have carried out the Lord's command. Then what is all the bleating of sheep and goats and the lowing of cattle that I hear? Samuel demanded. It is true that the army spared the best of the sheep, goats, and cattle, Saul admitted. 
but they are going to sacrifice them to the Lord your God. We've destroyed everything else. Skip to verse 17. Samuel told him, Although you may think little of yourself, are you not the leader of the tribes of Israel? The Lord has anointed you king of Israel, and the Lord sent you on a mission and told you, Go and completely destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, until they are all dead. Why haven't you obeyed the Lord? Why did you rush for the plunder and do what was evil in the, in the Lord's sight? But I did obey the Lord, Saul insisted. I carried out the mission he gave me. I brought back King Agag, but I destroyed everyone else. Then my troops brought in the best of the sheep, the goats, the cattle, the plunder, to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. But Samuel replied, What is more pleasing to the Lord, your burnt offerings and sacrifices, or your obedience to his voice? Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice, and submission is better than the offering of the fat of rams. Rebellion is as sinful as witchcraft and stubbornness as bad as worshiping idols. So because you rejected the Lord, the, so because you rejected the command of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Then Saul admitted to Samuel, yes, I have sinned. I have disobeyed your instructions and the Lord's command, for I was afraid of the people and did what they demanded. But now, please forgive my sin and come back with me so that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel replied, I will not go back with you since you have rejected the Lord's command. He has rejected you as king of Israel. As Samuel turned to go, Saul tried to hold him back and tore the hem of his robe. And Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to someone else, one who is better than you. And he who is the glory of Israel will not lie, nor will he change his mind, for he is not human that he should change his mind. Let's go to verse 30. It says, Then Saul pleaded again, I know I have sinned, but please at least honor me before the elders of my people and before Israel by coming back with me so that I may worship the Lord your God. So Samuel finally agreed and went back with him. And Saul worshiped the Lord. All right. So today we're talking about the pitfalls of Saul. So let's first start with this. What is the definition of a pitfall? A pitfall is a hidden or unsuspected danger or difficulty. It's also defined as a covered pit that is used as a trap. So what we're really trying to do today, and I need you to pay attention to this, is we're trying to unpack the hidden dangers and difficulties and traps that Saul got caught up in that ended up ruining his life, destroying his destiny and separating him from God. So we're going to look at three, three pitfalls today. Here's the first one, the, the pitfall of pride. The first one is the pitfall of pride. See, Saul had an issue with pride. If you go to verse 12, when, Saul, when Samuel went looking for Saul after he had won the battle, it says Saul went to Carmel to set up a monument to himself. See, God had given Saul instructions for the battle and provision for the victory. And the first thing Saul did when he won was to set up a monument to himself. He immediately tried to take credit for what God had orchestrated. See, pride is not giving God the glory for your wins and for everything that you have. Because everything that you have, God placed in your hands. So when you begin to think that it's solely because of your efforts and because of your intellect and because of your brilliance and because of your hard work or your hustle or whatever it is, once you start thinking like that, you're starting to put yourself in trouble. Now you might be intelligent, but you didn't choose your intellect. You didn't choose your level of IQ. God gave that to you. Yes, you developed it. Yes, you're supposed to work hard at developing yourself and your skill set. But you didn't choose who you are and what God put inside of you and the gifts of God that you have. Amen? So, yes, work hard. We're not saying that. And, and you can acknowledge that you work hard. But you have to understand that you are alive and you are accomplishing what you're accomplishing because of God's mercy and because of God's grace. God's mercy is when God doesn't give us what we deserve. God's grace is when God gives us what we don't deserve. A perfect example of this is in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15 from verse 9 to 10. See, Paul was actually the preeminent apostle, okay? Paul accomplished so much in God's name. He performed so many miracles. He won so many souls. He was he, Paul actually wrote a third of the New Testament, more than any of the other apostles, okay? In fact, while many of the apostles were focused on the Jews in Jerusalem, 
Paul's ministry went outside of Israel and into uh, different countries. He went to Italy, he went to Greece, he went around the world spreading the gospel. In fact, you and I are direct beneficiaries of what God accomplished through Paul's ministry. But here he is in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 9 and 10, and he says, For I am the least of all the apostles. In fact, I am not worthy to be called an apostle after the way that I shot my music videos. That's the Banky W translation. After the way that I persecuted God's church. Watch him in verse 10. He says, But whatever I am now, it is all because God poured out his special favor. Special favor means grace. It is all because God poured out his grace on me and not without result. For I have worked harder than any of the other apostles. Yet it was not I, but it was God working through me by his grace. And so you see Paul saying, yes, it is a fact. I've worked hard. I've worked harder than anybody else. I've pushed myself. I've tried. I've put in my effort. I've worked. I've done I've done the work, which is what we're supposed to do. But he bookends it. He begins with the grace of God. He ends with the grace of God. And that's what we need to do. We need to acknowledge the grace of God in our lives. We need to acknowledge that everything, all of our wins, everything that we have is because of the grace of God and for his glory, not ours. So pride is when you do not give God the glory for your wins. Pride is also when you do not reject the glory from men. It's okay to honor people. It's okay that people will choose to honor you, but you must recognize and you must acknowledge that you are but a vessel in his hands and you must always return the glory to him. I get really uncomfortable when people try to ascribe, you know, the people that I've helped or some of the efforts that I've done to me. And I always try to make sure that I say, hey, listen, it's not me, it's God that did it. He just used me as a vessel. And that's a, a lesson that I've learned and a lesson that I'm trying to put in my life and to tell myself over and over again so that I do not start thinking that I'm the best thing since sliced bread, that I'm the one that orchestrated things. I'm not, please. Ladies and gentlemen, we need, it's if God will not share his glory with any other. It says it right there in the Bible, okay? If you want to learn about pride, go and read about King Nebuchadnezzar in the book of Daniel and see what pride can do to a man, amen? So check the way that you speak about yourself and your wins because you can always find the traces of pride in the words of your mouth. Are you setting up a monument to yourself or are you acknowledging God and his mercy and his grace? You can always tell by your words. The Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if there's an abundance of pride in your heart, invariably it will come out of your mouth. The Bible also says pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. So because of pride, because Saul wanted to set up monuments for himself, for what God had done, invariably it was inevitable that he was going to end up in destruction. All right, so that's the first pitfall, the pitfall of pride. Who's with me? Are we together? Let's move on. The second pitfall is the pitfall of insecurity. The pitfall of insecurity. Now this is actually tied to the first pitfall of pride. Because you may not know it, it sounds like they're two completely different things, but pride and insecurity, actually, they're like this. They go hand in hand. You will never meet a prideful person that is not insecure. You will also never meet an insecure person that does not stumble into pride sooner or later. See, this is how you know if you're dealing with pride and insecurity. If you talk too much, or if you don't talk very much, or you don't talk enough, okay? And that's almost everybody. Most of us have at least one friend, you know at least one person in your life who you say, man, I love this guy or I love my girl or this is my friend. I love them, but they talk too much. Think about that person now. And if you cannot think of anybody that you know talks too much, then newsflash, you are the person we are talking about, okay? So most of us know somebody that talks too much. But here's the thing, while talking too much is an evidence of pride, if you dig deep enough, you will see that people talk too much and show pride because they're trying to cover up shame. They're trying to cover up something. They're trying to make up for something. There's an inferiority complex there that they're trying to make up for. So for some reason or another, they feel like, man, I'm not good enough. And so to make up for that, they keep talking and they can't shut up. They keep saying things because they want you to like them. They want you to love them. They want you to respect them. They want you to appreciate them. And that results in pride. Amen. 
Now on the flip side, when somebody doesn't talk enough, when somebody is too quiet, when somebody doesn't talk very much, it's again because of insecurity. Okay, they just haven't crossed over into the bright side of things yet. So if you place your valuation of yourself in man's opinion of you, you will be insecure. Seeking and treasuring validation from men instead of seeking after the approval from God will always lead to insecurity and to pride. And that was one of Saul's major problems. Saul sought validation from every single person around him except for the one person where it actually mattered. Saul sought validation from the very people that God had appointed him as king to rule over. Okay, he wanted validation from the children of Israel. That's why he set up a, a monument to himself. He wanted validation from his men. That's why, even though God had instructed him very specifically to destroy everything, he said, oh, you know, guys, take the best, you know, he allowed them to take the best of the sheep and the cattle and the plunder because he wanted his men to like him. He wanted their approval. He, he wanted validation even from the king of the Amalekites. That's why he spared his life. Okay, it wasn't for mercy. He spared the king of the Amalekites' life, King Agog, because he wanted another once powerful king to look up to him and to revere him and to cower and say, oh, thank you. He wanted, he, he sought that validation, okay? He even wanted validation from Samuel, which is why even when he was caught in his errors and Samuel was saying, why were you doing this? He was still trying to posture and, and lie and say one or two things because he didn't, he was afraid of Samuel's reaction. Listen to what Saul said in verse 30, when Samuel finally takes him to task. He says, I know I have sinned, but please, at least honor me before the elders of my people and before Israel, before coming with me to worship the Lord. So it wasn't even about worshiping the Lord. It was about, hey man, don't make me look bad in front of these people because I crave their approval. I crave their respect. I crave their validation. So even at that point, he's seeking validation from Samuel and from the elders and from Israel instead of just saying, man, I got to get right with God. Okay, Saul had his priorities backwards. So when we think about Saul, we have to equate it to our own lives. Are we seeking validation from everyone else instead of seeking approval from God? Do you get your validation from your friends or your family? Do you get your validation from your career or your colleagues? Do you get your validation from strangers on social media? We wake up in the morning and the first thing that we do is we run to the ground. And what do we do when we check, when we go on the ground? We check our likes, we check our retweets on Twitter, we check our DMs, we, ch we check our views. So what are we really saying when we're doing that? We're saying, man, I woke up in the morning, the most important thing to me is to see who likes me, who approves of me, who's watching me, who's trying to talk to me instead of taking some time to talk to God. And that's what we're asking. We're asking how many people see me? How many people are paying attention to me? And believe it or not, subconsciously, all of us start to subscribe to this idea of getting our validation from what men think, from what people on social media think, from strangers who you don't even know. But their opinion of you is so important to you. Amen? Here's the problem with insecurity. When you look down on yourself, you are actually looking down on the God that lives inside of you and the work of his hands. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So if you look down on yourself as a child of God, it's insulting to the God that lives inside of you. How dare you look down on what God made? How dare you look down on the temple of the Holy Spirit? When you're insecure about who you are, you are showing unbelief in the promises of God over your life. You are showing doubt in the word of God. And we know that God's word never fails. And that's just downright disrespectful to look down on the very words of God over your life. The Bible says about me that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So like Joshua, I will not be afraid. I will not be dismayed. I will be strong. I will be courageous because that's who God says that I am. And I'm a child of God. So you have to get your validation from what God says about you and not what man thinks. Because man's opinion is fleeting. The same people that love you today will be the same people dragging you tomorrow. And then they will love you again. They just flip back and forth. So you cannot put your confidence in that. Your confidence 
is in the in the surety that is the word of God and what God says about you and on the fact that greater is he that is in you than anything that is in the world. Amen. So that's the second pitfall, the pitfall of insecurity and it's not our portion in Jesus name. We're going to make a change from today. Hallelujah. Come on. Let's go to the third pitfall. Pitfall number three, the pitfall of disobedience, the pitfall of disobedience. Ladies and gentlemen, if you live in constant disobedience to God's principles, you are inevitably and eventually doomed to fail, just like Saul did. Um, somebody once said, I don't know the secret to success, but the secret to failure is trying to please everybody. Well, that statement is only partly true because the secret to failure is trying to please everybody, but we do know the secret to success. I've talked about this before. The secret to success is having, as a child of God, if you carry the manifest presence of God with you, then you will be successful. Okay? A perfect example of this was Joseph, right? If you study Joseph in the book of Genesis, it didn't matter whether Joseph was in prison, it didn't matter whether he was in Potiphar's house, it didn't matter whether he was in the palace with Pharaoh, wherever we saw Joseph, at whatever stage of life he was in, he was successful, he was prosperous at every stage. Why? Because the Bible says over and over again that the Lord was with him. In Genesis chapter 39 verse 2, it says the Lord was with Joseph and he was a successful man in the house of his master, the Egyptian. In Genesis 39 verse 21, it says the Lord was with Joseph and he showed him mercy and he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. The end of 30, um, Genesis chapter 39 verse 23 says, the Lord was with him and whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. The keys, the words, the Lord was with him. Amen. So if you want to prosper, if you want to be successful, ladies and gentlemen, as children of God, the secret to success is to carry the manifest presence of God with us. If the Lord is with us, we don't have a choice but to be successful. You know why? Because God is successful. Because God's word is successful. God's word never fails. So as long as we carry that presence of God with us, then we don't have a choice to be successful. Now the key, the secrets to carrying the manifest presence of God with you and for God to be getting involved in your affairs is obedience. Because God and disobedience, they don't, it's like oil and water. They don't go together. You cannot be disobedient to God and then expect God to be actively involved in your affairs. All right. So if you want his manifest presence in your life, in everything that you do, then you must be obedient to him. Saul was like the poster boy for disobedience. And what happened to him? He disobeyed God repeatedly over and over again. And God departed from him and took the kingdom away from him. He altered his destiny because of his disobedience. Now, we didn't have time to go into 1 Samuel chapter 13. But if you can read it in your own time, in 1 Samuel 13 verse 13, it says, Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The same thing happened in 1 Samuel chapter 15 that we read today. Time and again, God gives Saul specific instruction and Saul disobeys. Now check the difference and we'll go get more into this in, in the upcoming week. But in 1 Samuel chapter 18 verse 12, it says Saul was afraid of David. Why? Because the Lord was with him. Remember, the Lord was with him. That's the key. But the Lord had departed from Saul. In verse 14, we say that it, it says David behaved wisely in all his ways. What does that mean when you behave wisely? It means you are paying attention to what God's principles are and you are abiding in them. You are obedient to them. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 19 to 20 says, if you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. The key is being willing and being obedient. Obedience is the key to carrying the presence of God with you. Job chapter 36 from verse 11 to 12, it says, if they obey and serve him, they shall spend their days in prosperity and their years in pleasure. But if they do not obey, they shall perish. Now, it's important for me to clarify here that we're not talking about salvation, okay? You are not saved by works. You are saved by grace through faith, okay? So if you have faith and you confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are saved by His grace through your faith, amen? So we're not talking about salvation. 
What we are talking about is being blessed and successful in this life as a child of God. Yes, you are saved, but if you want God involved in your affairs, you have to make an effort to be obedient to God in all of your affairs. Now, are there ways in which we live our lives in direct disobedience to God's principles, to God's word? You see, as human beings, we have what I like to call selective amnesia. So we forget or we ignore or we just skim over the things that we don't like and we focus on the parts that we do like. But guess what? Type this in the chat room. Selective obedience is not obedience. Selective obedience is disobedience. In fact, there is no such thing as selective obedience. You're either obedient or you're not. Amen? So today we've talked about three pitfalls of Saul. We talked about the pitfall of pride. We talked about the pitfall of insecurity. And we talked about the pitfall of disobedience. But why do we think that Saul gave in so easily and repeatedly to these three pitfalls? I mean, it's clear what the consequences of his actions and his decisions were. But why was it that Saul was so easily tripped up in the first place? And I believe the answer is in that same 1 Samuel chapter 15. Three times in 1 Samuel chapter 15, three separate times in confrontation with Samuel, Saul refers to God as the Lord your God. Check it. 1 Samuel chapter 15 verse 15. Let's go to verse 15. Saul says, It's true that the army spared the best of the sheep, goats and cattle. Saul admitted. But they are going to sacrifice them to the Lord your God. Let's go to verse 21. Verse 21. It says, this is Saul talking again. He says, Then my troops brought in the best of the sheep, goats, cattle, and plunder to sacrifice to the Lord your God. Let's go to verse 30. When this jumped out at, out at me, it blew my mind. Verse 30. Then Saul pleaded again, I know I have sinned. But please, at least honor me before the elders of my people and before Israel by coming back with me so that I may worship the Lord your God. Ladies and gentlemen, Saul never saw God as his God. He always, he, repeatedly, he's referring to God as the God of Samuel, not as his God. So Saul wasn't worshiping God because he had an innate desire to. Saul was worshiping God or serving God because... It was a show or because it was what people expected of him. He didn't have a relationship with God for himself. And when there's no relationship, then there's no responsibility, no sense of responsibility or accountability. So Saul was only serving God because it was what was expected of him, not because it was what he wanted to do. And it's the same thing for us. I'm sure most people that are tuned into this program right now believe that God exists. We know that God exists. We know that he's real. We believe that he's real. But do you see God as some far off spiritual powerful force that created the heavens and the earth and is just off doing God things and not really concerned with your life? Or do you see him as your father and your friend, as your comforter and your counselor? Do you see him as your teacher and your treasure? Do you acknowledge him in your daily life? Is the time that you spend with God just on Sunday during service and then that's it until next Sunday? Is God your source and your strength? Or is he someone that you don't really find time to even talk to or get to know on a day-to-day -day basis? Are you building a relationship with God? Are you getting to know God day-to-day? -day? Is, is, he, is he an essential part of your day and an essential part of your life? Amen? Or is he somebody that you only call when you're in really big trouble? And we all know people that only call us when they need something from us. Is that the kind of relationship that you have with God? Or are you trying to develop one? Are you trying to get to know him? Are you trying to make him your best friend? Are you spending time with him on a day-to-day -day basis? And to me, that was the major difference between David and Saul. Because they were both winners of many wars. And they were both sinners with many flaws. But while Saul showed us what it was like to have, it, to have a life that saw God depart, David was described as a man after God's heart. The difference between Saul and David is the difference between religion and relationship. Because at the end of the day, when you come face to face with the wars that you will have to endure and the battles that you will have to fight in this life, it will not be enough to believe that God is real. 
He has to be real to you. So let's bow our heads now and give God, give the Holy Spirit a little bit of time to make this word come alive in our hearts. Everybody watching this, take a moment, bow your heads, close your eyes, and just give God a moment to make this word real to you. <laughs> 